I'm going to introduce. So I'll just um, take a second to introduce Dr. Gilliam and um, our 41st um, McLean Clinical Medical Ethics Lecture Series. As you likely know, um, this uh, whole year, the lecture series, the topic has been gender equity and ethics. Um, this is our ninth session. Um, we have had a great fall with both um, in-person speakers and virtual speakers who have joined us and talked about a variety of gender ethics topics from sexual harassment to publications to research. And um, we look forward um, to having um, eight to nine more speakers in the winter and eight to nine more in the spring. So we will continue on. Um, we're taking the first Wednesday in January off and then um, we start 11th with um, Joanne Conroy, the CEO and president of Dartmouth Health. So, um, but today we're really excited to have Dr. Melissa Gilliam back. As you likely know, she has been, and I'll talk in her introduction, she's well known to us at the University of Chicago, and we're excited to host her back. So let me take a second to introduce her, and then I'll have her share her slides and start the talk. So Dr. Gilliam is executive vice president and provost at The Ohio State University, where she holds the Angie Axum Chair. At the, as the institution's chief academic officer, she oversees 15 colleges across six campuses with more than 67,000 students and nearly 7,600 faculty members. Prior to joining Ohio State in August 2021, Dr. Gilliam was vice provost and the Ellen Block Distinguished Service Professor of Health Justice at the University of Chicago. Her scholarship focuses on adolescent health and well being. She earned a medical degree from Harvard Medical School, a master's degree in public health from the University of Illinois at Chicago, a master's degree in philosophy and politics from Oxford University, and a bachelor's degree in English from Yale University. Dr. Gilliam is also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And it really gives me great pleasure to welcome her back to the University of Chicago today. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Gilliam. Great. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. It's so nice to see all of you all and, and so many friends. So uh, really exciting. Hi, Deb. How are you? It's good to see you. Hi, Dorian. Um, and um, miss you all so much. It was such a, um, oh, hi, Anne. Um, it was such a strange thing to leave during the uh, pandemic. So I felt like I barely, um, I barely got to say uh, goodbye. So I'm again, really excited um, to be here. So I was asked to talk about um, some issues related to gender and gender diversity in academic medicine. And so um, some of you who have heard me speak will um, might recognize um, some of the, the slides and the points because uh, much of this is what I learned from working with you all and, and uh, many things that I've thought about um, from my work here, my work um, at the University of Chicago. So what I'll do today is talk um, uh, about this issue from uh, what I call a design perspective. And, um, and I'll go a little more deeply into that. But as you know, um, much of my scholarship and um, practice and approach to administration kind of thinks about the idea concepts around designing and thinking about uh, different futures than we see currently. And so I'll kind of take you through that. So um, as you heard from Julie, um, I um, am here at um, Ohio State. So a very different type of institution, um, a land grant, uh, Big Ten uh, institution and um, Really, uh, one of the things that we have to think a lot about here is um, the entire workforce, and it's really given me an opportunity to think about the medical workforce and academic medicine, and how um, academic medicine and um, gender and uh, racial uh, equity in academic medicine has always been such an important part of how we think about reducing health disparities, getting better science, getting more innovative um, innovative uh, science and being able to relate to our patients. So um, this is, uh, this is uh, a really wonderful topic that you all are examining over the course of the year. Um, and so I wanted to start off um, just at that point. Um, we um, have known for a long time that um, having a diverse biomedical workforce um, is critically important. Um, we know that uh, 
people from different backgrounds, different perspectives bring in uh, different ideas. And it's really important for the way that we solve problems and the way that we solve complex problems. And it is critically important to how we will address issues of disparities in health because of people's ability to have various insights into patient populations and different patient um, experiences. And so when I talk about these issues, I like to talk about this almost as enlightened self-interest. It is good for science. It is good for medicine. It is good for um, all of the things that, that we care about. Um, and yet this is um, really challenging and it's actually very challenging to be part of academic medicine. Um, there is both um, incredibly high expectations um, of us and what we do. Um, and yet it is a time um, when there is limited uh, public trust. Um, there are uh, lots of concerns for how we'll fund the work that we do. And yet we have concerns around various partnerships. Um, it's very hard to recruit and develop a physician scientist um, there are we the cost of what we do is um, quite quite difficult um, to uh, to manage and then there's also kind of issues around um, working in the collaborative ways that we need to work and so some of the challenges of what we're thinking about as we think about gender um, and gender issues in medicine are also related to the challenges of academic medicine itself. Um, I talked a little bit about why diversity is so important, um, and it's not just coming um, from me. It is also um, one of the core um, concepts uh, that um, the National Institutes of Health has gotten behind because we have an increasingly diverse population and we want to have a robust uh, STEM and uh, biomedical uh, workforce, we are going to need to think about the pipeline um, of both the people who participate as well as the leader leadership. And so it means that we can't uh, lose people along the way. We need all of, uh, all of the talent that, um, that we can find. Um, but what we know is that the pathway into these fields is quite leaky. So, you know, we are often looking at our colleagues or we're looking at this opportunity to recruit people, but all along the way, um, and you'll kind of hear me as I speak, talk about issues of women, issues of underrepresented minorities, the intersectionality of these two issues. Um, but what we know is that at each, um, of these stages, the pipeline has leaks such that people um, get discouraged um, from pursuing uh, careers in academic medicine. And so um, that contributes to the problem that we're talking about. So when we talk about that, you know, I, I think we often think about this as you know, ability or skill, but um, as I showed in that previous quotation, um, it, this really isn't just a, a skill or ability issue. That would be uh, one thing. In fact, what it shows is that the skill and the ability is quite um, quite equally distributed, um, but the opportunities and some of the um, discouraging factors are not. Um, and so there's actually quite a literature um, on um, issues of uh, what we would call bias or systematic um, biases that um, lead to limitations in women and underrepresented minorities um, in, uh, in academic fields. But this is just one um, example. And so um, what I like about this is that it is, um, I mean, I don't like the findings, but I, what I like about this study is that it really studies us, um, those of us um, who are actually in these, in these fields. And what they, what they did is this is just kind of one of those simple audit studies, but they created a single intervention. It was just kind of a, um, a, an email and they were asking, it was, I'm posing as a student and I'm asking for uh, help mentoring, uh, mentoring support. And in it, they just decided to use different names that would uh, signal different races, ethnicity, and variation in gender. And what it showed is that just faculty, just on a routine e email, they were more likely to respond to a white male uh, inquirer, a quote unquote white male inquirer, because it was a fake uh, candidate, than they were to almost any anyone else. And this was across disciplines. Um, and what was interesting about this is it 
the race, gender, identity of the person who received the email, um, that didn't, that actually didn't make a difference. And so it's important, it kind of looks like this, that, you know, everyone might have the ability, might seek opportunity, but particular people um, are chosen. And what that means is that we have to not only think about the ability and the skills and empowering the individuals, but we have to also think about um, the context and the people and the systems around them. And um, I was... Uh, I included this slide because it's important for us to realize that as we're thinking about all of these issues, there are also these other larger contextual factors such as the pandemic and that can, can cause burnout and can uh, cause dissuade people even from wanting to, um, to work and fight and uh, address many of, of these issues that as they affect their own lives. So that's sort of the background, this kind of how do we start to think about issues of academic medicine? How do we think about academic uh, leadership? And so I, um, as I've gotten to this point in my career, I find just as many people, um, some people want to know uh, what I know and kind of about my scholarship. And a lot of people want to know, what are you doing? How did you figure out how to get through this part in um, academic medicine? So I just thought I would take a little bit of a second um, and tell you um, about my own pathway through um, through uh, this uh, complex environment that that we're in. So um, so um, I'm the middle child. Uh, in, in my family, so the one all the way on the left, um, and. Um, and I was born in uh, Washington, D.C. And I, I tell people about that because I think that um, in retrospect, it was quite um, an advantage to live in a majority minority city. Um, I think when I was growing up, it was probably uh, about 70 percent um, uh, non-white. And so you end up actually feeling um, you know, quite normal uh, and and uh, and quite included in many many um, environments. And um, while there was some level of uh, segregation, there was also um, people who lived all all over um, all over the city. And you didn't feel. Um, I think many of the things that I've learned about subsequently um, uh, around um, the historical role that uh, race plays in this country, I think I was a little less um, uh, uh, aware of it, um, or in some ways growing up uh, where and how I, I, I did. Um, one of the things I learned early on and had um, a lot of exposure to was that, um, was what it meant to be a working, uh, a working person and being um, a, a a woman who worked in environments where uh, there were not many people who looked like them. And that was through my mother, who um, was uh, um, a journalist. Uh, she still does a lot of writing, but she was the first black woman to be a reporter at the Washington Post. And so I grew up hearing her stories of what it meant to um, be the only one or not uh, have uh, colleagues who necessarily understood uh, what you were doing and also not having colleagues who had uh, little children at home um, because it was a predominantly male um, work workforce. Um, the other uh, tremendous influence was uh, my father, who, um, as an artist, I think had sort of, I, I think what I learned was uh, what it means to have a career where there's no clear uh, pathway in front of you, where you're kind of making, uh, making decisions, making uh, choices, um, but not necessarily here's the school or here's the here's the ramp and you have a guaranteed um, outcome. So I, I think I learned um, how to deal with quite a bit of uncertainty from uh, both of my parents. Um, I went to schools that have similar architecture to the one uh, that, uh, to the uh, institution that you all are a part of. And then um, what I, I became very interested in the topic of teen pregnancy. I think in many ways, um, when I was graduating from, uh, from residency, I think it, for me, it was thinking about the major social issue of my growing up time and thinking that, you know, 
not being getting pregnant as a teenager probably had a big part had a lot to do with um, how I got to where I was, um, even though that was a pretty simplistic story and actually probably uh, I was at quite low risk. Um, but it did seem like a big social issue that we needed that I could um, devote my career to. But what was really behind it is um, what is the is the question that I really do think I um, spent my time on, which is why do some people have different life outcomes than others and what can be done about it? Um, but initially I thought it was the pregnancy itself. And so I had always um, spent my time in biomedical labs and in basic science labs. And so I thought about this as a biomedical question. Um, and I got very interested in um, contraceptive development, contraceptive discovery. Um, these are some studies I, um, I, did on uh, thinking about um, the pharmacokinetics of, um, of, uh, of the implant. Um, but what was interesting is I was, in, even there I was saying, well, if you're obese versus normal weight, you're gonna have a different outcome. What is it about different people, different contexts, different situations? Wow. But what I also learned um, at the same time, I began to also talk to young people. I began to do focus groups in communities and I saw that there was a disconnect. We were thinking about this as a biomedical issue if they just remember to take the pill or if they just use a longer acting method. And what I was hearing from young people in the community was our lives are far more complex. These aren't methods that I want to take. And I started to realize that we weren't we really didn't have the tools to hear and listen to young people. So for me, I began to realize that we were not dealing with the full social ecology of teen pregnancy if I was more focused on the clinical and biomedical aspects of what we were doing. And that because of my background as an English major and I had studied politics and philosophy and public health, I was actually quite equipped to at least ask curious and good questions about the policies and the other societal systems. And so one of the things that um, has just been uh, such a gift has been um, the uh, curiosity um, and the way that at the University of Chicago, how we've been able to work in an interdisciplinary way. And that's how I ended up starting um, the Center of CI3 um, at the university. And in it, I began to think, you know, how do we start to explore these more, um, these outer circles, right? Not only the individual, but the social and the political. And so CI3 really became a place where um, we could put young people at the center listen to them and their own understanding and stories about um, their health and health condition. Um, and part of this is also the story of saying, you know, your research can actually be um, done in a way that you think, right? You could sort of, your field goes this way. And I learned that I could actually build something very different and think about something very differently than it had been thought about before. Um, and so this is kind of a typical project, um, really centering young people and hearing their voices and teaching them about clinical care and having them critique and develop their own systems for how they want to provide care. And I think in many ways it um, reflected um, what I was almost a personal experience in that um, I had thought that I understood, I had been trained to think that I really understood and could listen to patients and prescribe, only to find that we were missing all of these other aspects of young people's lives that were probably um, bigger uh, determinants. And so I think now, 20 years later, we have um, a very strong language around the social determinants. But I think I was living through that moment, realizing that we've got to bring these factors into the clinical um, context. And so that's really um, the part of the story. And then the flip was that we have to also understand really the logistics and the barriers to uh, young people's lives. And so this is um, a partnership that we had with the Comer uh, Mobile Health Unit, and then the it's called the Pedia Care Van um, that allowed us to say, what if we could work with young people to help them overcome the barriers um, in their in their lives by bringing healthcare to them? 
And so um, this is a uh, device that we co-designed with young people that was their um, interpretation of how they'd like to um, get contraceptive and health information. Um, but again, uh, they were the ones who designed and formed and helped create. And then through partnership, we um, developed a new way of working. Um, and then this is a project that um, we did um, in India and we're just finishing it. We just finished it uh, right in the wake of the pandemic. But again, um, working with young people and teaching them to design uh, their own systems, their own solutions, and then using um, our expertise and methodology, um, working with them to design and develop inter interventions. So I tell you that, um, one, so you can know a little bit about me and a little bit about uh, navigating um, academic medicine, but also um, so you can get a sense of why um, I've been um, so interested in this idea of designing in a human-centered way and how I think these are lessons that we can actually bring to the administrative um, sphere, but also to our as we try to think about and disentangle some of the challenges around um, gender in academic medicine, uh, racial uh, diversity in academic medicine, but also diversity in general in academic medicine. Um, when I talk about diversity, I um, define it very, very broadly. Um, I think we are better for environments that are richly diverse um, with people who think in different ways, uh, people who behave in different ways, um, even if they're ideas that you don't believe or uh, perspectives that you don't agree with, um, I think we are better off um, for them. And so I really do believe in creating richly diverse um, environments. And so um, this is the basic way that when you enter into a design process, it's sort of you explore and you look for the questions, you generate ideas, you prototype and test, and then you try to continue to iterate and refine. And I'll take you through this um, uh, a little bit towards the end, but um, what I, uh, what I, um, the way that I approach things and the way that I encourage us to approach things is more with kind of the questions in mind. Um, and then this idea that you can generate multiple solutions. And so when I talk about diversity um, and this idea of why this is so important, um, and I use that term enlightened self-interest, it's because I think that if we bring in diverse cohorts of people um, with lots and lots of different uh, backgrounds who are thinking in different ways, and then we put our energy in saying, how do we make sure that we have a rich culture where people feel um, included a sense of belonging, that they can take risks, that they can um, bring their best ideas, then we increase collaboration and productivity, and then we get more innovation, and then we address um, issues that we care about, such as health disparities. The reason this is so important and why um, I will often talk about culture when um, in my own uh, office, my own leadership, we spend a lot of time on, um, on the culture and the experience of um, individuals um, is because that's what the research shows us. So this is um, something called the social cognitive careers theory. Um, and it's a theory about why um, underrepresented minorities and women do or do not enter into biomedical uh, research careers. And um, so if you sort of, uh, you know, so we all have our own backgrounds and the things that we bring to it. We have kind of our abilities and, and, uh, and other skill sets. And then we have a series and that you know, contributes to how we experience and how we learn. Um, and you know, we build self-efficacy and we also have expectations of uh, whether good things uh, will happen to us. And that then leads to our interests, our goals, and our actions around pursuing certain careers. And so, you know, a person input or background contextual factor might be, I have a parent who is a physician and I um, got had very, very positive um, experiences, or I know all about um, being um, a physician, or I know all about being a researcher. But the tricky arrow is this one up above, and this is these proximal and contextual factors that are having direct and indirect um, impact and influence on our interest goals and actions. And what um, Lynn Brown and Hackett have said is that for many um, 
many under people who are currently underrepresented in the academy, those barriers, um, those actual and perceived barriers and facilitators often are in the form of a negative, often negative um, uh, experience and expectation and perception of how you will be treated in those environments. So your kind of concerns or your actual experience or the narratives or stories who you see around you, that those actually have an effect on whether you have an interest or goals. And so if we sort of think about kind of along that pipe that, that pathway to these careers, it's those atmospheric factors that actually discourage people. Now, the thing about these, this particular theory is they're talking about people at fairly young ages. And so we know that even your middle school and your high school experience, and really your middle school, your early experience um, around science, math, STEM, and whether you have a sense of belonging, uh, that you might belong in those careers, can have a tremendous uh, effect on whether you actually pursue those careers. And so um, this is a kind of another way of looking at this idea of don't just think about individual ability or individual uh, responsibility. Think about the social and, uh, and larger context um, in which, um, in which we are, we're functioning. And so um, from that, I kind of showed you that in my own research, I think about adolescence and adolescent development as kind of this uh, ecosystem. Um, I, I think we can think about academic medicine as similarly as, uh, as an ecosystem, whether the individual, there are factors at the individual level, the social, the infrastructure, the policy, and the external world as it, as it um, impinges on us. And if you kind of unwrap that, we could think about this as kind of an underlying infrastructure that contains the policies and programs, what happens with the people, the climate, and then the larger, larger context. And so some people look at that and they say, oh my gosh, there are so many factors. How are we ever going to address issues of gender um, in academic medicine? Um, but for me, I think it gives us more levers. And so one of the big um, things that people have focused on is how we address the systems and the infrastructure that could help people achieve different behaviors. So instead of um, just focusing on, you know, did you say that or does she have this ability? Um, how do we think about um, facilitating the behaviors that we'd like to see? So you're wondering, what is this photo? So let me show you uh, this photo, which is a short video that gives you conceptually what I'm talking about. idea. Um, and so the idea is that you can start to, um, because changing and shifting behavior is so hard, we can actually look for um, interventions and other ways of working that can actually shift behavior. This is a study that I think a lot of people have seen. Um, this is the um, this idea that when orchestras went to auditions where they couldn't see um, who was performing, they um, fewer of their biases entered in and the number of women in orchestras began to um, increase. And the other way of sort of thinking about this and um, uh, again, uh, coming from research uh, at uh, the University of Chicago, that we can start to think about ways of shifting behaviors 
incentives, but this other, this middle thing, this idea of nudges, contextual factors and other, other things. Um, the person who um, really has championed this work is Iris Bonet, um, and uh, she is an economist at Harvard and who has really looked at this idea of connecting design and gender equality. Um, and um, I, I found her book really interesting, and so I encourage you to read it and dive more deeply into it, but I'll share a few of her ideas um, as I talk about working through these various, uh, these various levels. Um, so again, um, the, we'll kind of start out at that uh, kind of this policy and infrastructure uh, level, because I think that's one thing that we have to really do is to start to think about um, our, the policies and the, um, and the opportunities that we might have um, to actually wanted to skip this one, um, the opportunities we might have at a policy level to start to move um, the uh, move issues of uh, bias and to increase uh, gender and uh, gender and racial diversity. So one is to really start to look at um, our path to promotion for physician scientists and really look at each, um, each rung of the promotion process and to say, and to really look at the data and to say, you know, at each of these, at each of these rungs, at each of these levels, um, do we have equitable processes? And the way that you would do that is really look at your outcome data. Are people being promoted um, at, at the same uh, level? Um, when we have one of the strongest uh, biases we have in, and not biases, but one of the strongest uh, things that we uh, do in um, in academic medicine is that we say, you know, funded research versus non-funded research, and um, people have to buy out their time. But have we given people the structures and the systems to um, ensure that they can be competitive at funded research? And are we making those systems and those um, and that knowledge equally available to um, individuals? Um, when we have um, when we have uh, policies such as sabbatical or remote work or uh, pay, are we looking at those and are we looking and making sure that those are equitable and are they being um, used equitably? And then I think we can also think about our roles as advocates. Um, one thing that I uh, was involved at um, in at one point with uh, was recommendations to a committee I was serving on at NIH. And one of the things that came up was uh, the issue of K award salary. And what I what you realize in that is that that is one of the best ways to become an academic researcher, but the salaries um, are not really equitable with what it means to be a clinician. So that's how you can actually lock people out of these processes. Um, and again, are we using our, um, our power and um, abilities as advocates to really look at the things that might um, enable us to uh, create um, careers? Um, and so, you know, we have things at, um, or you all have things at the University of Chicago, things like the ability to have tuition access to tuition benefits for your children, tuition, uh, tuition benefits, training benefit, uh, professional development at work, but all of these things um, that can actually be in um, policies are things that you might not think um, are necessarily gender equity issues, but they have when the ways that they get applied and the potential benefits from them can have um, gendered outcomes. And so this is kind of uh, um, this idea of thinking about the design of the system, not things that require, that rely on personal decision-making, but that underlying design as ways of um, influencing and places to look for ways of influencing equity. Um, one of the, so if we kind of um, move into this, the next layer, we're kind of thinking about sort of the social and other types of um, interactions. And so um, one of the reasons I wanted to include this image is because we often think about issues of gender equity, but um, you know, our identities are far more complex and um, the uh, factors that influence us, influence our behavior, our reactions, our, uh, how we're treated um, go far beyond issues of gender. And I know that the, um, the focus today is on issues of gender, but many of us hold multiple identities, all of us hold multiple identities. And so I want, even as we sort of talk about issues of gender, um, 
our uh, our experience of our gender is also being uh, filtered through all of these other um, identity factors. And for, um, and uh, you know, the parallel picture is it can feel like a web and people can feel quite, um, quite trapped by this. And so um, how do we start to think about um, these broader issues of diversity? Um, one, um, one thing I, um, I believe is that we have to hold our leaders accountable as champions of diversity, um, because often leaders are the ones who have the ability to address these issues. Um, so these um, show up everywhere from hiring, um, the actual who is in um, roles of leadership. And I think when we talk about leadership, we should be talking about formal leadership, but also informal leadership, um, or uh, leaders at you know, senior levels, but also leaders at um, at levels throughout. And when I talk about informal leaders, um, I mean that um, our ability, whether it's our ability to uh, lead our families or lead our classrooms or lead our research teams, um, those might not necessarily have leader roles, but that's where we're developing the skills and abilities um, and uh, knowledge that we need as, as we take on subsequent uh, leaders ro leader role. And so I think this is both holding our leaders accountable to help people in all of those phases um, of those careers, but also to be the ones who are accountable for policies that could be applied um, inequitably. Um, but the other piece um, I, I talk a lot about um, is the ability to hold ourselves accountable. Um, and so um, it, is, uh, it is difficult to change other people's behaviors. Um, but part of, but much of the work that we have to do around the ways that these various, our various identities um, influence um, ourselves and our reactions is actually we also have to be um, cognizant of, um, of how they can um, influence us. And then um, I would also flip that in one other way, which is that leaders also have to um, have to hold themselves accountable. And um, for those of us and you who are in leadership positions, really thinking about um, how uh, you can use your position to address these issues. Um, other tools and levers at this point, at this level, is how we use rewards, how we use um, accolades. I think this is something the University of Chicago has done incredibly well: is to really look at, you know, endowed positions. How are those distributed? Who? Um, who's being rewarded? Um, because those are the things that show. Um, who's valued, who's valued in an organization, and that can help to also create a scaffold to, um, to elevate uh, people. And then the other role, I think, for um, leaders is also um, when they see power um, structures or people who are using their power in positions in unfair ways to, um, to be the ones who interrupt and address those things so that individuals who might be experiencing um, bias and, and um, other forms of uh, harassment or discrimination don't have to do that, that work themselves. Um, the other piece here is that um, this the the component of just uh, a sense of wellness and um, and stress and burnout. Um, I think at another time this wouldn't seem um, at, at uh, another uh, time uh, this would have seemed like quite a novel uh, idea. But um, I think we are increasingly understanding this connection between stress, burnout, mental health, and people's ability to continue to stay and thrive and survive um, in an academic medical environment. Um, one of the biggest challenges has been, for example, um, equitable share of, um, of dependent care uh, responsibilities. And so that's why equity and pay, leave and time off, all of those things can contribute to a sense of wellness, mental health, well-being that, again, makes people better able um, to um, not become part of that leaky pipeline that I described earlier. Um, another uh, 
one of um, when Iris Brune talks about structural factors, um, she talks about something as simple as the images of success that we feature in our environment. Um, so that even you don't necessarily you don't always have to have an individual. You could actually have a representation of an individual, and these are. Um, leaders from the University of Chicago that can actually shift people's um, understanding and biases around um, gender and gender equity. So um, again, just a ways in which even um, when you don't necessarily have the tools or the women leaders in place, you can actually start to show um, that um, these uh, successful uh, and diverse uh, leaders exist. And that helps to decouple um, one's brain and starts to shift biases. Um, the other piece that um, as we start to get to that internal level, we also need to think about the individuals themselves and empowering the individuals themselves. So one, they can um, withstand some of the challenges um, in these environments because they don't shift over overnight but also um, because ultimately um, what we're trying to do is be successful scholars, um, uh, teachers and practitioners. And so that the, the success of, the, of all of us as individuals is, um, is everyone's success. And so um, this idea of um, building a network and building a, a supportive network, but also training people in some of the unwritten uh, rules and uh, of, of being successful um, at what we do. And so um, I remember very early in my career, I was visiting with um, Jane Hall, who's now here at uh, the University of Chicago, but she wasn't at the time. And I was telling her about this grant I was trying to write and how um, difficult it was. And um, she said, oh, I can help you with that. And so we just worked together and I just learned so much about grant writing. Um, and, you know, it, reading books just, you know, just couldn't, wasn't going to do that. Um, and so I think part of this is um, we have to have the skills to initiate those uh, relationships, to ask those questions, um, uh, but also to really making sure that we are there to support um, and teach and, uh, and mentor the next uh, group of, of people. So I think as leaders, there are ways that we can support that. One is giving people information, you know, really teaching um, people how to do research, to be really mindful of how difficult it is to balance being a physician as well as a researcher, really providing lots of opportunities for funding sources, those early funding to help people get started so they can scaffold um, their career. There, I just use graphic and editing support, but think about those sort of things that are more of a support system, but where um, it makes kind of the difference to, for having a great research grant or a great, um, or a great outcome or a great presentation. Um, and then um, we can also be intentional around communication and training people to tell their stories. Um, there's um, a great project out of um, NIH, uh, it was called SciBytes, where they actually trained early career scholars just to tell their, just to be able to tell their stories. And I'll just give you um, a quick example, and I promise I will save time for questions. Hi, my name is Sonia, and I'm a post-baccalaureate researcher at the National Institutes of Health. We all know that breathing in smoke and harmful chemicals can damage our lungs, but some people experience particularly strong reactions to these sorts of environmental exposures. My lab is trying to figure out why, by studying how genetic differences contribute to a deadly lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In this disease, certain environmental exposures like pollution and cigarette smoke badly damage the lungs, leading to inflammation, so it's simple, but basically the idea is that um, she's taking a, a her lab, her lab-based science, and she's telling it in a story that is relatable. Um, and there are lots of um, there are lots of these videos, and you can take a look at them. But they're um, but some of them are super amusing, um, really well done. But by learning early in her career to explain her science in a way that's translatable, that will be 
great for presentations, funding, and all of those things to make a successful career. So I was just going to finish by just telling you a tiny bit about um, this idea of this design process. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and uh, and and finish up, but by just telling you um, this uh, final thing, which is um, what I was hoping to do is give you kind of a number of entry points into ways and places where you can start to explore opportunities to rethink systems, reduce bias, whether that's at the systems level, the cultural level, the empowering people to be more successful in their career. My bias is a little bit more towards um, academic, but that you can imagine this, these same types of insights for um, clinical or teaching or other aspects of academic medicine. But the idea is that I think often we look at um, issues of uh, gender and inequities and uh, diversity in medicine, and we get really like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? This is all so problematic. But um, when you start to think about this as um, a place where there are many insights and many um, levels to redesign, it really opens up um, so many possibilities for how we can shift uh, the culture, the, uh, the culture, the systems, and ultimately the complement of people um, in our field. So I will stop there. And if people have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilliam. That was great. So feel free to type questions in the chat or if you wouldn't raise your hand, um, we can call on you, can ask out loud. I'll just ask the first question. I was really struck by the kind of infrastructure, the video of the stairs. And I, um, I've read a few books myself on how sometimes infrastructure um, doesn't support gender equity. And then I, um, it was, I was reflecting on the kind of structural tensions right now about remote work, which has been so great for some people and the tension to come back in and maintain community. And I was just wondering if you could speak about Ohio State and what you're doing there for that and, um, and what you think the positives and negatives are around that kind of infrastructural opportunity, but also kind of how it affects us. Yeah. So yeah, remote work is kind of, it's an interesting one, right? So um, so just as I was leaving the University of Chicago, we did a lot, uh, uh, Melinda Hale, uh, Melina Hale led a very, um, and worked with HR and led a very, very careful process around um, remote work. And, um, and here we were um, a lot looser about it, what we, um, because we started later. We surveyed people, and um, as you can imagine, um, people really wanted a great deal of flexibility. And so what we said is um, we'd like people to be in at the university um, about three days a week um, was kind of the idea, um, With um, would, would be the idea. My own personal opinion is that we that probably we should say the default is in person, um, and where and I and part of it is because I worry about um, our undergraduate students and I worry about our students and who's there and what um, how many of us have to be here in order to maintain um, the the spirit of the university. I also um, uh, think there's a bit of a risk because. Um, decisions, um, opportunities get created um, uh, just spontaneously by bumping into people. Um, and I worry about people um, who are remote just losing out and losing um, those opportunities and the knowledge and the information. Um, but I think it's good. Uh, and I also think I worry sometimes about some of the so social isolation um, and uh, so I can sometimes see rumors starting and then they calm when everybody comes together. And sometimes when we get too atomized and we lose a sense of community, those things get lost. And so there's a tension and I think, um, but I'm comfortable with the tension. Yeah, um, and, and I think that's what we should sit with because I think we're at, this is, uh, this is really moving. This is, um, the final thing I will say is I think we have to, um, think about designing and creating the conditions 
that um, are created and that people are valuing with remote work. So if you're working remotely because it gives you more privacy and you can get more done versus I'm working remotely because I don't have the resources for childcare, we should try to address the issues for childcare versus um, thinking that someone is getting as much work done if they're at home. Um, taking care of children or other dependents. Um, so what I would also say is let's disentangle what people like. Um, and then the final piece is just being competitive. So I, I don't think our IT folks are coming back um, because we will lose them to other institutions. So um, there's no easy answer, but I do think um, to the extent that remote work is a proxy for something else, that we might be able to address in other ways, knowing that institutions can't be all things to all people. I, I would like to know that and see what things we can improve upon. Wonderful, thank you. I see uh, Maya Vukovic, you typed something in the chat. I'm happy to read it out, or I see you're on camera. If you'd like to ask it in person, you could also go on mute and ask it yourself. Great, hi, Melissa, great to see you again. Um, hi. Uh, so I'm a current student at the Harris School, um, working on my MA in public policy, and I've been at U Chicago for 20 years as an, as an administrator, and I'm looking to make a career pivot change. And so I'm interested in hearing you talk more about the role public policy can play to better support some of the ideas and themes you're discussing. Yeah, so um, I'm a huge um, I'm a huge fan of policy solutions, um, and I like them because just sort of philosophically and conceptually, because um, I can come up with an understanding between you and me, or I can make a local arrangement. Um, but there are many, many people who um, will not benefit from that, who don't have the institutional power to be able to say, you know, advocate for what they need. Um, and so policies, um, uh, and you have to both implement and follow up and, and implement and follow up and see what you thought, whether what you intended to happen um, is really the outcome that you intended and how does it affect individuals. So I do think policy is iterative. So I'll, with those caveats in mind, I do think these fundamental policy issues are um, the way to address um, so many things. Um, I think, first of all, um, trying, um, so I do think we have to try to be as inclusive as we can as we create policy. So I think we should be putting to, when we look at things and, and uh, look at issues, we should uh, have um, teams with lots of different perspectives so that we're not inadvertently uh, harming one person while you're trying to improve the system for the other. Um, but um, at the University of Chicago, um, we had um, the Provost Council on Women, where we really tried to look for the policies that could be inequitable. Um, those were that's how we ended up with Bright Horizons on campus and other uh, that that uh, these other things that are these kind of interventions um, and resources that can make big differences. But I think all of the things um, that people benefit, whether it's the policies around. Um, uh, tuition payment for uh, for students at the laboratory schools. And then people said, well, if I had a student who couldn't go to the laboratory school, could I have a benefit at another place? All of those things are at the policy level, but they are the things that have trem make tremendous differences in people's lives. Um, so I encourage um, people to continue to sift through and examine their policies. I'm, I, I'm constantly sort of saying, wait, what, what does and doesn't work? The only thing I would say is that, um, again, making sure we're looking to see the impact and the influ influence and the unintended consequences. And I have a lot of stories about uh, that as well. So um, really um, making sure that we address those. And finally, I think teaching people to work at the policy and systems level, um, it, it's very hard to do. It takes a lot of work, but I do think it is um, a translatable skill because it affects so many aspects of our lives. So I'm really glad to see you doing the work that you're doing. Um, and yeah, and good luck to you. Wonderful. Are there other questions from the audience? I'll ask a question, uh, Julie. Melissa, it's so great to have you here. and. Um, I think that um, so many elements of your talk really struck, you know, hit home with us, especially around nudges and sort of the staircase, as Julie described. 
Um, I'm curious, um, you know, if you as you think about advancing uh, women leaders, you know, and especially um, during this very um, time where, you know, of mid career, I, I've actually just spoken to two or three um, in in our institution who are easily recruited away, and um, and how do we um, how do we really think about retention? Because I worry that we are at risk of losing a lot of people that, and maybe some exit is okay, you know, like for example, you left and are, have this amazing role, but what's your advice in terms of how to be proactive in order to retain people at these transition points? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, people often, um, people often leave not, um, you know, sometimes because they're, you know, getting quote unquote a better deal. Um, but, um, and sometimes it's clearly a promotion or an opportunity to do something else. But I think um, what many people value about academic medicine is that you can change your job without changing your address. Um, and so that you can continue to grow and learn without um, changing your address. And I, um, I can see many people on the screen who represent that. So I think the first is um, that career and that growth possibility. And then I think the second is um, people um, leave and stay based on um, their social and personal um, situations. So if you feel connected to your colleagues and connected to your environment, um, then it is actually quite hard uh, to, um, to uh, leave. And also, um, and I can speak to that as well, it's very, very, very hard to, um, hard to leave. So I think we're doing the right thing by having, um, thinking about uh, childcare and thinking about schooling and thinking about the, the community that we have around, uh, that you all have around campus. I, I've gotten better at that, but I still do it, um, the, that you have around campus where your friends and your colleagues and your, um, and your, and, uh, your family are all, are all in the environment. I think that is one of the stickiest things, but it is that idea of, am I being seen and am I being seen in the way that I see myself? Um, and so when people feel as if they cannot, if their career and aspirations that they are aiming towards, nobody sees them or appreciates them, then it's much easier for them, them to leave. So I encourage both the professional, but also that kind of more qualitative, softer, harder to put a finger on, but ultimately critically important. Thank Anne you. Anne Borders, I don't know if I can do yeah, it. Yeah, she has a hand raised, yeah. Hi, Anne. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, good to see you. We're so glad to have you back and speaking and we're thinking such good thoughts of you on your, on your new position. But I wanted to ask um, just briefly, I've so appreciated your talk and I'm curious uh, strategies that you use or you, you wanna mention for leaders who wanna support um, women in academics, particularly in um, early career, but sometimes not um, managing child rearing, um, and what are strategies we can use? You've mentioned, I think, a, a couple, and you just talked a little bit about that in the stickiness. But what are some things that, as leaders, we can be thinking? Um, you know, what what should we be advocating for in order to to support uh, when making that transition into early career academics and and into success when they're also trying to manage um, uh, their busy jobs and their their academics and their research and um, and, and child rearing. Um, and do you, do you have thoughts on, I'm sure you do. Yeah. I you yeah. Do. I think there are kind of two things. One is um, you have to kind of help people build the individual level skills to manage time and all of those other things, because you're always going to feel like you don't have enough of it. And I, I think there are kind of skills and, and ways that you can um, think about that and, uh, and uh, think about doing high quality work when you have the moment. And then the next is, you know, if you know that your children and your family are, are okay, then you're okay, right? If you're not trying to split your attention. And so that's why we need not only safe childcare, but after school care and all of those other things. Um, and, um, and also the ability if, um, so I am 
very, uh, if someone needs to leave or if someone has something happening or if they need some time off, all of those things um, having tremendous amount of flexibility. And then also have the ability, like how do we create policy so that if someone has to leave the workforce, they can re-enter or if they have to work part-time or they have to work three days. So when I first started, um, I was at UIC, a state institution, and I had my first child and they were like, oh, you have all this vacation time. So I was like, maybe I'll come in four days a week, or maybe I'll come in three days a week. I had that kind of flexibility. Now, obviously, I was spending a lot of it working, but just knowing that I could have a little more flexibility, I think, allowed me to be really productive. So I think those are the areas that I would look at is really how do we give people the support um, uh, we had kind of the dependent care grants where you could, if you're at a conference, you could, um, either bring, you could pay for babysitting or bring a babysitter along. And we had some grants through the university for that. Um, those types of things that allow people to have not only the support, but kind of the peace of mind. And then the final is just giving people the social support to say, what you're doing is fine, right? It is okay to be a working mom and, a and, you know, that's why I showed the image of my mom, because I was like, it wasn't always perfect, but it turned out okay. And I was kind of like, you know, I, I realized that um, knowing that um, and being able to share that story with other people is also really important. I know we're at time, so I, I uh, please, Anne, finish. I was just going to say, I loved seeing the pictures of your mom. That was like one of the, I just, that was fabulous. She was, yeah. she was. Super fabulous, just like you. So thanks oh. for sharing. <laughs> right. Well, Dr. Ellen, we'll, we'll wrap up this part of the talk. Um, usually we stop the recording. And then um, if it's, I don't know if you have 15 or 20 more minutes, usually we have some time for that. Oh. If you're free, if not, we understand. Um, no, no, I do, I do. I thought I was, okay. um, I thought I was taking people's time. Oh no, 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 I'm no here. you're fine. Usually we, okay. we stop the big group session, and then I think Viva Renata they stop the recording, and then sometimes we have like the ethics fellows come and just get a little bit more personal time with you. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Part of their mentorship because this lecture series is part of their ethics um, fellowship training. And so, um, so for all the rest of you, thank you for joining us um, and I'm happy to have you sign off. And for the ethics fellows, if you'd like to go on camera and come and just have a little bit more personal time with um, Dr. Gilliam, um, we are ready and available to do that now. Um, so, oh yeah, Dr. Norcott says thank you. Hey, Candace, it's so nice to see you.